Hi, this is Debbie Dashinger, and I am inviting you to a free webinar with me for one hour. So come live. This is going to be called Starseed Shamanism, where ancient wisdom meets cosmic connections. Anybody who knows me and my work and my Dare to Dream podcast knows where my heart lives on the conversation specifically about extraterrestrials and shamanism. So join me for an hour. The registration is below. You must sign up to get the Zoom link and the date and time is also below. Um, talking about captivating things such as extraterrestrial open contact, shamanism, shamans and star beings uh, beyond the veil. And who are the shamans? What are the encounters they have had since the inception of time? I'm gonna go deep into that about the different tribes and the different alien groups, if you will, or beings that they've been in contact with and how it shaped them. The consciousness of plants right now. And also I'm very excited about this from a major project I worked on recently. I'm going to be showing footage of six of the most well-known extraterrestrial channelers explaining some information about these subjects that nobody has seen or heard. Again, Debbie Dashinger, join me free. I'm a certified shamanic practitioner and healer. I'm a Moonaiki rights practitioner, 17 years doing the Dare to Dream award-winning podcast, and I'd love to spend some time with you. So go ahead, click below, join me, and I'll see you then. Welcome to the award-winning Dare to Dream podcast with Debbie Dashinger, covering metaphysics, ETs, shamanism, and channeling. Here you will find spiritual inspiration from today's thought leaders, along with cutting-edge insights from our interstellar brothers and sisters and ancient shamanic wisdom. Now, here's a new episode of Dare to Dream with your host, Debbie Dashinger. Welcome to Dare to Dream. This is Debbie Dashinger. And folks, today I'm going to be speaking with Paul Hynek about aliens, DMT, and Bitcoin. Dare to Dream Podcast won three Talk Radio Positive Change Awards, the COVR Award for Best Podcast Show, Wolp Magazine named Dare to Dream one of the top 20 best podcasts to listen to this year, and it's high ranking on Apple Podcasts. This show is sponsored by Dr. Dane here and Access Consciousness. They do energy work out into the world. If you'd like to become a facilitator or take one of their classes, go to Dr. Dane here, H E E R.com. If you'd like to know what your galactic ancestry is, I've got a free gift for you. You can unlock your cosmic potential with this free Starseed report and video. We go deep diving into at least 19 different galactic beings, and you are probably at least one of them. It's pretty captivating information. So if you're ready to find out your own star lineage, go to debbie dot com slash starseed. That's D E B B I D A C H I N G E R dot com slash starseed. And my guest and I are going to be appearing February 2025 at the Conscious Life Expo. Best event every year. I highly recommend you attend because you're going to hear amazing speakers like the one we have today. I'm also going to have the link to buy your tickets for LA Conscious Life Expo in the show notes. And it is debbiedashinger.com slash CLE. And finally, you can join me for the largest channel panel ever in Sedona. This January 2025, this is going to be a weekend of transformative workshops and keynotes from myself, renowned channelers like Daryl Anka, Wendy Kennedy, Jamie Price, and Lisa Royal Holt and Rob Gauthier at the Sedona Performing Arts Center. It's an opportunity to connect with like-minded individuals and gain profound insights. I think it's the most beautiful way to start the new year. So join us. You can secure your spot, get your ticket at debbiedashinger.com slash Sedona, D-E-B-B-I-D-A-C-H-I-N-G-E-R.com slash Sedona. My guest today is Paul Hynek. He's a Horton MBA and professor of finance and cryptocurrency at Pepperdine University. 
He's been involved with movies like Avatar, Lord of the Rings, Planet of the Apes, and numerous other movies and games before selling a visual effects firm to James Cameron. He's the son of J. Allen Hynek and wants to help experiencers of all kinds demonstrate the reality of their encounters. And if you'd like to learn more about Paul Hynek, you can go to Twitter, where he's got a very active account. And Paul, I welcome you to Dare to Dream. It is so great to have you here today. My pleasure, Debbie. I'm really happy to be here and have what I think will be an engaging conversation. I think so, too. Thank you. You know, your Twitter account reads, this is a quote, entrepreneur, professor, futurist, CFO by day, UFOs by night, DMT when I can, Bitcoin to save the world. Mm, That's so good. So (laughs) I just want to dive a little bit into that. Um, Bitcoin is interesting because I have to say this was... I know about it, never on my radar, just completely didn't understand it. But I've been working a little bit with somebody who is trying to enlighten me at Mm -hmm. this time about the importance of cryptocurrency. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. So when I speak at conferences like Conscious Life Expo, I'll often be there mainly for UFOs. Um, and to various degrees, I will start talking about DMT and psychedelics and Bitcoin. And people will say sometimes, man, Paul, we're here talking about real stuff like UFOs. Why you got to get weird and talk about DMT and Bitcoin? Now, nowadays, people often have most questions about DMT. So that's not weird anymore. But Bitcoin is. And I would have thought there'd be sort of a natural affinity between people interested in UFOs and aliens and cryptocurrency, um, for one, because the U.S. government is, I think, many people in the UFO community would agree, a bad faith, corrupt central actor. They've got a lot of information. They piecemeal it out. um, And they're not really helping the situation. It's the same thing with Bitcoin in particular. Bitcoin was created in 2008 as a response specifically to the financial crisis. It is not about a bunch of tech bros making money. It is actually good for the environment. And there's a lot of antipathy towards it. But one of the questions I ask people at like a UFO conference is, okay, so you don't trust what the U.S. government says about UFOs, right? And they say, of course we don't. Oh, But you trust what they say about Bitcoin. Oh, that's interesting. Um, You know, it's a long conversation, but Bitcoin really is, you know, cryptocurrency. If you strip away even the financial layer, the central ethos is decentralization. It's individual empowerment. Hmm. And that's the same thing with psychedelics. It's empowering us, enabling us to fulfill our, our best selves cryptocurrency and Bitcoin allow us to vote securely, to send information or to engage in financial transactions without the approval and usurious interest or fees paid to some third party bank or some other installation or institution. So Bitcoin really is this movement towards individual empowerment and wrestling control back of some aspects of our lives from governments who I feel don't really represent our best interests. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I know there's a lot of talk these days with, I'll call it a purge going on in the planet. There's so much chaos happening, so many Mm. breaking down of old paradigms and ways of being and mores that just don't serve us anymore. And even though it feels very chaotic to people, It actually, I think, is part of this ascension. And I have heard multiple times, be ready for some financial chaos. There's going to be things coming down the pike, and your bank may not be the best place to keep your money. So if Bitcoin cryptocurrency Mm -hmm. is a viable place 
for what's to come and for our now and our future, is it very much like watching the stocks and knowing when to get in and out and what to invest in? And is it something you have to do on a daily basis, like a day trader? It's actually the opposite. I know people have this impression, one, that Bitcoin is this ethereal digital thing with nothing behind it. And we can get more into that. But to this specific point, people say Bitcoin's volatile. Well, it's at its all time high right now. It started off, it's the best performing asset in history, bar none, by orders of magnitude. It started off, uh, the first transaction was in May of 2010, and the value of one Bitcoin was one quarter of one penny. It is now worth over $92,000 per Bitcoin. That's nice. So yeah, it's had ups and downs, but it's this meteoric rise of millions of percent of return. There is nobody in the world who has bought Bitcoin and not sold it who is not happy today. Hmm. So, and, and my feeling is I, I'm involved with a lot of cryptocurrencies, but for folks who are interested in leaning into it a little bit more, there's a great book called The Bitcoin Standard, which is a great economic treatise by a professor at Columbia, The Bitcoin Standard. But what I would say is, if you're wondering which cryptocurrency to buy and you don't really want to spend all the time, JBB, just buy Bitcoin. And then, <laughs> along with that, Debbie, NSB, never sell Bitcoin. Hold on to it for your lifetime. Fidelity Investments, hardly a cryptocurrency boutique firm, has predicted that one Bitcoin will be worth $1 billion in 15 years. Now, that may or may not transpire. That also, unfortunately, means that the US dollar could crater, which could is not good for us to have the dollar completely fall apart. But for me, as a professor of finance, the very best investment anybody can make any time is Bitcoin. And then to your point, you don't have to monitor things every day, every week, month, year, decade. Just put it in there and let it go because it will keep going. And I believe to the converse of those who think that our nuclear installations are sending negative beacons to, let's say, a galactic federation, I believe the digital breadcrumbs of Bitcoin could be sending a positive beacon to other inhabitants that we have finally put on our adult clothes, our big boy pants, and are ready to have this sort of level of conversation because Bitcoin represents so much in terms of societies advancing to a point of true social enlightenment. Wow, that's a big claim. And I believe in something called Bitcoin astronomy, that other civilizations out there, if they have individuals who have individual economic motives, if they have limited resources and they don't have magic, will almost inevitably create their own analog of Bitcoin in that it's a, a proof of work governance store of value. And that may be the link that we have to communicate with other civilizations. You know, when we colonize Mars, what will they use for money? Are they going to use the U.S. dollar and monitor Fed broadcasts? No, I think they'll use Bitcoin. Then they'll become frustrated because they can't mine it. They'll create their own coin called Mars coin and Bitcoin will be called Earth coin and will represent our planetary credit score. That is so interesting. Wow. Really interesting. Lots to think about there. I have my friend who is uh, guiding me to invest, like to rearrange my money, right? He suggested Caleb and Brown. And I had a conversation with the rep there who was asking me all sorts of questions before I were to get started. And he said, oh my God, like you absolutely know nothing. I think you have oh. to start with YouTube and start watching videos and then come back and we can have a conversation. And for me... Um, yeah, 
uh, there's not enough time for me to sit down and learn no. it at that rate. So um, I had to put it on the back burner. But I hear you saying, I like this JBB, just buy yeah. Bitcoin, <laughs> just jump in. Yeah, I've had a lot of friends ask me for financial advice. And I could, I'm just thinking of a kind of a, of a joke where I make like 100 questions for them to fill out. And then I can tailor an approach to them. But whatever the answers are, it's going to be buy Bitcoin, right? Because it's the best investment you can possibly make. It's outside the yoke of governments. Nothing has performed this well. It's on, it's at its historic high now, and it's going to keep going up, I feel. Um, so just buy Bitcoin, baby, for the win. And, and also to help the planet. To help the planet. Yeah, it's very positive. <clears throat> uh, gold also is pretty incredible, right? And I think even silver, gold more than silver. Gold is a good investment in short time periods when things are chaotic because people get nervous and they put their money in gold. Over the long term, gold is a historically awful investment. Oh. If you look back 200 years, gold hasn't even kept up with inflation. So Bitcoin is often called digital gold because what it has in common with gold is scarcity. Every year, there's about 1% new gold introduced to the overall supply of gold. And that's why it's called a hard currency, because it has this scarcity. And when, in the periods when the U.S. has been on a gold standard have been periods of prosperity for us. But now, as of 1945, we are off any kind of gold standard. And then 1971 again. And... We don't back anything. People say, what's Bitcoin backed by? Algorithmic certainty, mathematical logic. There can never be more than 21 million Bitcoin. And the number doesn't really matter because you can buy less than one Bitcoin. But the US dollar, the concept is backed by the full faith and confidence of the United States government, its military, etc. But the value of an individual dollar is backed by nothing. It's inflation happens every year. We're accustomed to think of that as natural, but it's really legalized counterfeiting on the part of the government. And people talk about, well, you buy a house and it will be worth a lot more later and you make a lot more money. Sure. But if you sell that house, every other place you want to live has gone up in value as well. So have you really gained that much? Hmm. And you're talking about holding on to Bitcoin for a lifetime. Don't let it go. There must be a point in each person's life where they want to start taking withdrawals, payments to self. Yes. When yeah. do you recommend that that start? So that's a good point. You Well, as little as you can, as late as you can. But there are ways, you know, the super rich, they don't usually sell things. They monetize things and they get loans, right? So if you buy... Manhattan real estate 100 years ago, it's in your interest to keep that. Now, you may peel off some of that, but you can get loans against that. And there's the same kind of financial structures evolving around Bitcoin. So one of the things I would say is develop a goal like one Bitcoin or, or one tenth of a Bitcoin or whatever it is, and just hold on to that because it may take only one tenth of a Bitcoin or maybe a hundredth of a Bitcoin to achieve financial independence. Wow. That's beautiful. Thank you for that. That's mm -hmm. really enlightening to me. Um, I'm going to switch subjects because I thought this was so interesting. There were nine people who completed a Stanford trim study. This pushed oh. back <clears throat> each participant's biological clock. Yeah. And they said when the study was completed that you, because you were one of the participants, Paul, that you were in effect younger than when you went in. So considering you're 92 years old right now, <laughs> kidding, but is it true? Is that still going on, this sort of Benjamin Button um, age reversal? Yeah, yeah. And I may have the, the record as documented in a medical journal for having reversed my age the most. Um, I was speaking at a conference and there was another guy speaking about this trial he was doing, the first ever in FDA history not 
to fight this or that disease, but to combat aging as a whole. And he talked about how the idea was to regrow the human thymus gland, which is located behind your breastplate. The thymus, which I didn't know at the time, is what creates T cells, which are thymus enabled cells, which are white blood cells, which are effectively your immune system. And in men and women alike, after the age of 20, your thymus involutes or shrinks to the tune of about 3% per year. So you get progressively less resistant to various pathogens. And so I'm a transhumanist. I'm interested in radical life extension. And there's a broad consensus in the life extension community that there are a lot of things we need to do if you want to live a long time. But job one, before stem cells, telomeres, and whatever else you want to do, is the immune system. Because you can do all sorts of stem cells and telomeres and everything else, but if you can't handle getting sick, or if you get sick too much, it doesn't matter, you'll die. So I heard about the trial, and I said, I, will, I need to be in this trial, and I was, and it's amazing. The doctor behind it is one of the smartest medical minds in the world. His name is Greg Fay. The company is Intervene Immune. And I did that trial. We were published in Aging Cell magazine. We've been featured on three different documentaries in Europe and one here. Uh, I did another year-long regimen. I joined the company as CFO. And I'm now undergoing another year-long regimen because I'm such a big believer in what this company is doing to really be on the forefront of life extension. Mm. You know, I I remember the word T cells from the 1980s when yeah. AIDS was a thing. <clears throat> right. And that's what you would hear right. about when right. somebody had contracted AIDS. They were always monitoring their <laughs> T cells. And of course, when they got yeah. very low, it was very dangerous for the person. Uh, so I'm aware of what you're talking about. And it's very interesting to hear about this, the potency of the thymus. And so when you're a part of this study or this program, what does it address? Is it a way of eating? Is it supplements you take? Is it something very modern, like a med bed? Yeah. So about, you mentioned about AIDS. My uncle, who was Mater D at Studio 54, back in the day, uh, succumbed to AIDS. So that's something near and dear to my heart. Yeah. Um, the protocol for this thymus rejuvenation starts with human growth hormone, which a lot of people confuse with steroids because it's taken by athletes in conjunction with steroids. But it's a really a, a very interesting substance. Along with that is metformin, because one of the yes. adverse side effects of human growth hormone, perhaps the only one, well, if you've got a precancerous condition, that's not good. Apart from that, one of the only real potential side effects is insulin spikes. And metformin, I saw you nodding, has interesting anti-aging properties in its own light, helps tamp down the insulin spikes. And then we also take zinc, DHEA, vitamin D, and we've tried melatonin and resveratrol and other things. But the principal agent is human growth hormone. Um, and I did a lot of research about it because I do injections four nights a week with this. And so I wanted to see, hey, what are the risks? There's a very low risk profile associated with this. And for me, wanting to live a long time, I have a very good risk of dying in my 70s or 80s or 90s, if I do nothing, a very, very high risk. So if I want to change that, I need to do something different. And I found this protocol and the people behind it to be so solid that um, I'm as excited about this for improving my health as I am about Bitcoin for improving the world. That is so awesome. I am thrilled to hear you say exactly what you just said. I didn't expect it. I thought I was going to hear products that I've never heard of before, very cutting edge things. Mm. But I take metformin every day. I also self-inject subcutaneously and I vacillate between uh, human growth hormone and Samorlin. Samorlin does All right. Right, the same. I definitely utilize peptides and I'm... Uh, yeah, I also take uh, BPC-157, which is really beautiful if you need to regenerate 
bones, muscles, any kind of tears or injuries. And I have, I have a little bit of athletic injury going on. And it's amazing how functional I am from it. And I'm really interested to look into more of that uh, self-injecting around NAD and some other kind yeah. of miraculous things that are out there and available today. Yeah, you know, um, so we're we're cut from the same cloth about this. And, you know, I, I deal with objections a lot about people who either don't believe in UFOs or who have misperceptions about psychedelics or who think Bitcoin is bad or who think that wanting to live longer is selfish or there's not enough food or jobs to go around and all of these things. But in terms of this kind of cutting edge medical research, if our great, great grandparents hadn't invested in medicine, I wouldn't be alive now. I'd be past the born on date. So apart from selfishly wanting to live to be longer, I think we owe it to subsequent generations to see what we can do to eradicate diseases, to improve the robustness of our immune system, which then naturally leads to a longer, healthier life. So you're not in a wheelchair for 30 years, but you're active and robust with your health span. I think we owe it to them. We owe it to the children, Debbie. Wow. I agree so much. I mean, you were going to be here for however many years and the quality of life is so important. My mom had Alzheimer's. Oh. Uh, she, yeah, she ended up at the end. She couldn't really walk. She had all sorts of um, bone issues. And then she was in a beautiful place. We found this amazing uh, home for her and they took such great care. I was very happy she was there, but still like, what is that quality of life? Yeah. You know, at the end, she couldn't even form a sentence. Mm -hmm. And I'm really yeah. clear also about brain health. And it is so important. I just started adding creatine. Yeah, to what I did, right? Creatine was something I always looked at like, oh, that's for guys who want to, you know, get huge. And then I come to find out it's so important for women. It clears the brain fog. It causes you to really think very clearly and I have found a difference. I've just been adding it to my oh. coffee <clears throat> along with my collagen powder. In the morning, it's tasteless, but I actually feel a difference that quickly. I'm, I'm glad to hear you say that because I just added that to my list. And the other thing I do, well, I take some nootropics, but um, I'm also a big fan of ginkgo biloba for the brain. Um, that's an old one. That's been around a long time. Yeah. Yeah. And I've seen some podcasts that talk about that for brain health and GABA, which you can't supplement. You have to sort of do an indirect end around to increase the production of GABA in your brain. Um, yeah. You know, I, I'm, I'm a hacker. I, I have a lot of background in software and software. People look at the world as an endless series of challenges that they can hopefully improve. Um, and I don't take anything for granted, much less death. I think death is a bug, not a feature. I don't think that death adds any inherent meaning to life. I think if you could live 100 years, 1,000 years, or escape the shackles of these mortal confines and live in a digital life, I think we are headed, like it or not, to a post-biological future I'm a big fan of Viktor Frankl and his logotherapy and man's search for meaning. You tell me today, hey, Paul, you're going to live forever. Oh, and by the way, your cherished ones will too. I think I could find meaning in that life. I don't think I need to have the sword of Damocles hanging over me that, hey, something's going to happen to you in the next 30, 40 years, and that's it. Oh my gosh, I better squeeze meaning into life now. I just don't it just, that doesn't resonate for me. Yeah, absolutely. I'm with you. You know, while we're here and whatever we can do to make it the best ride possible, I'm all about it. I really am. <clears throat> and I'm really curious. I don't know if anybody's ever asked you this. Have you yourself ever had an extraterrestrial or direct UFO spacecraft experience? <clears throat> I would say two answers. 
Short answer, no. Somewhat longer answer, yes, with an asterisk. All right. Can we go down the road of asterisk? What does that <laughs> yes. mean? So first of all, um, as with my father, whatever value I might be able to add to this field doesn't come so much from what I've seen or experienced, but it's the patterns I can help sort of tease out of data and helping unify databases and things like that. Um, I don't really have a horse in the race as to the origin. I, I think clearly there's a phenomenon here that I call meta-terrestrial, beyond our conventional origins. Some of that could be secret military, some of that could be extraterrestrial. I don't think it all is. Some could be interdimensional, inter -tempo extra temporal, you know, time travel, like Chinese menu, all of the above. I don't know. But my asterisk is because I was uh, in a restaurant here in Calabasas with a friend of mine who knew about my father. And he said, hey, where did your father think UFOs came from? I said, oh, he's a scientist. So attesting to a phenomenon is one thing. Ascribing a provenance is quite another, but push come to shove, he kind of leaned towards interdimensional. You know, for a rocket scientist, the idea that biological beings are getting in a craft many light years away and coming here is a little bit sloppy. First of all, it's non-trivial for them to even find us. The universe is big, really, really big. And for them to come all this way why are we that exceptional is life that rare i don't know and then what i think also are they sending their a team are we getting the the you know the rejects <laughs> um and maybe that's why we see a lot of the grays because they uh -huh. you know they send them but they could also be ai sentient bots which is another sort of interesting thing and ai is a, another passion of mine but so my friend asked me where's your dad think you of us came from i said maybe interdimensional he says Oh, you should read a book called Alien Information Theory. I said, Alien Information Theory? That's like the sexiest book title ever. What's it about? And this is like seven, eight years ago. And he said, DMT. I said, what's that? And he looked at me like, I guess I look like somebody who should know that. And he said, oh, it's a most powerful psychedelic. Like, wow, okay. And for background, I may or may not used to have long hair like yours. I may or may not have done tons of psychedelics in my younger days. So I'm like, okay, well, but what's that got to do with interdimensional origin of UFOs? He goes, oh, the author talks about how he thinks, and he's a neuroscientist, PhD, that DMT is not a hallucinogenic psychedelic drug, but rather a plant medicine technology that facilitates communication with interdimensional entities. And I said, okay, well, you had me at D. So I'll, I'll look into this. Later that day, I met a new guy at that same restaurant. Somebody said, hey, Paul can help you get your movie made. I talked him out of making the movie. And he said, he told me what he does, blah, 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 blah. And I facilitate DMT sessions. I'm like, wait. I just heard an hour ago what this is and you have it goes, yeah, we could do it right now. Well, I was going on vacation the next day, but two weeks later I did it. And the reason I mentioned this is that in my first session with DMT, I had what they call a breakthrough. I was convening. I was seeing the fabric of the universe being created. And I asked, hey, are you what we perceive to be UFOs and aliens? And I felt trillions of miles of synapses and neurons firing. And the answer came down to me, we can't explain in a way that you would understand. And I thought, well, first of all, that's not no. And yes. Then I thought, well, if these mysterious DMT machine elves are somehow related to aliens and flying saucers, I can see how that connective tissue, how that land bridge would be beyond my levels of comprehension. So I was fascinated from the get go with that. And that that appealed to me because I've, I've long thought that what we striate or silo as different phenomena, UFOs, psychedelics, 
ghosts, lucid dreams, remote viewing, Bigfoot, whatever, may not be at their foundation completely discrete phenomena, <clears throat> but may be the same intelligence that can instantiate in different ways or <clears throat> is perceived by us in different ways because of our own cultural and technological biases. So that's my asterisk answer. It's a great answer. It's a thought provoking answer. And you know, I'm so glad we're now here because I was going to take us here. So thank you for that. Mm -hmm. I heard you two <clears throat> years ago. I was a contact in the desert. I go every year. And um, only event that doesn't recognize me, by the way, it's the weirdest <laughs> thing. Like all these events bring me in to speak, to introduce speakers, to occasionally do an interview there. But like, I don't know, I know contact in the desert is going through some management changes. But I was, I go there every year. There you were on stage. I went, I went to see Dr. Andrew Gilmore because I totally follow his work. I'm highly aware of him. And to see you both on stage. All right. <clears throat> what a great job. I mean, you were there, I think, ostensibly to interview him. However, you were also sharing your stories yeah. about DMT. Now, here he is a scientist who hmm, plays in this field also, <laughs> experiments on himself. He's, he's even done this process, which is like a drip so that he can keep yeah. himself under for a projected period of time. I just find right. it all fascinating. So just like to level the playing field, I've done... 25 journeys with ayahuasca, three of which have completely changed who I am and the trajectory of my life forever. So grateful. And, you know, Buffo, and I'm sure there's other things that I think more deeply. And I also was a little wild in my younger years. <laughs> so I haven't done DMT, but I know my curiosity is enormous. Mm -hmm. Will you start, just for folks who are like, what's that? It's not Bufo. It's not the toad. What is it? Right. What is it? Will you explain to them? I know it's a molecule and yeah. so forth. Yeah. So let me get sort of map out the topography. Then let's come back to Andrew Gallimore. So uh, DMT is the same substance as ayahuasca and Bufo, but they're very different experiences. I like to think of the overall DMT family tree as having two main branches. One is sort of the purgative, which is cleansing and removes toxins and is very introspective. Ayahuasca is the best known version of that, where you may throw up. And that, that's off-putting to a lot of people, but in that type of ceremony, it's appropriate and you really feel like you are getting rid of things. Correct. The even more intense version of that is called combo. And that is where there's no bones about it. You start on your hands and knees, they <laughs> inject you with frog venom in your arm and you've got a bucket and the bucket is not symbolic. <clears throat> and that's all that is. And that's not something you do often, but that's sort of like a, re a psychic spiritual reboot. Mm -hmm. Now, the other branch of the family is what I call the exploratory branch. And it starts off with NNDMT. When people say DMT, what they typically refer to is NNDMT, which is a lot stronger than ayahuasca, but also very short lasting. It can be like five minutes. And, and people are always amazed if they do a, a, a fairly large amount that first time, how fast and how far they go. And then 10 minutes later, they're checking traffic on their phone. Everything's back to normal. And, and that is often administered like something called changa, which is along with some other herbs, including the ayahuasca vine, or in a vape pen. Then you have 5-MeO, which is even stronger and is often synthetic. And then we have what, you, what you've done, which is bufo, bufo virus, which is the, the venom of the desert Sonoran toad. And if you don't think Mother Nature has a sense of humor, <laughs> this toad says, Dude, you come near me and you're tripping balls. I mean, that's hilarious. And Bufo is about the strongest experience you can possibly have. For me, DMT, the NMDMT with Changa or vape pen is that really good level of as intense as you want it to be, but workable. So you can explore, you can communicate, you can have 
such emotional cleansing. The, the first night I did DMT, I had that experience where I asked, are you related to UFOs? I did it again that night, completely different experience. It lasted 45 minutes. It came in me. I felt it cleansing emotional sludge. I'm living between the beats of the music in a song called Devi Prayer, which is the official anthem of DMT for me. <laughs> and I'm living between grief and gratitude. Oh. The next time I did it two weeks later, it said, welcome back, Paul. Let's resume where we left off last time. It remembered me, my name, and our last therapy session. And so it's this sort of duality of what it brings. And I now host ceremonies, and it's been a very fulfilling thing for me to see the unbelievable experiences that people have had during it. Now, Andrew Gallimore, he's the author of Alien Information Theory, the book that drew me into this. <clears throat> and so... I was amazed by that book. So I knew the former and now the current owners of Contact in the Desert. And I reached out to them because I saw that Gallimore was on the speaker list. And I said, hey, mm. how about Andrew Gallimore and I do a presentation together, UFOs and DMT? They said, yes. I pitched it to Gallimore. He said, yes. And we met the night before, hung out all weekend, have become good friends, mm. and are now investigating a case together because I got an email from somebody who said, Hey, I saw you on Gaia talking about DMT and aliens. My jaw dropped because you're the only person I've seen talk about that. And I have proof of that. So Andrew and I are now working with him and his partner on developing a proof protocol to like, as you mentioned, my passion is to demonstrate the objective reality of those experiences. So it's been a very rewarding time. And Andrew Gallimore is a brilliant man and just a super cool guy. I'm so curious. I, I want to go somewhere else, but I can't. It's a bit of a cliffhanger. So uh, how in yeah. the world do you prove this? And how did this man have proof? I know you're right. working on it. So there's uh, probably NDA and so much you can say, but what can you say about it? So... And, and, you know, so many of these things, these experiences, I call it around the cornerism. Oh, I have this thing. I, I talk to Zorg from Zeta Reticuli every Friday and I'll ask him the question. Oh, he wasn't there that day. There's always something that happens. Well, and, you know, for a lot of people, a lot of experiencers, they're not interested in what somebody else thinks. They have they find value. And whether it's objectively real by someone else's criteria or not, doesn't matter to them. That's fine. But some others, and I've met hundreds of people in my life who say I, I get messages. Well, okay, if you're getting messages that are important to impart onto humanity, I think it would help if we can demonstrate the bona fides of that entity, because then that message will get out like wildfire. Mm -hmm. So when these guys approached me, they said, we have equations that we've received from the DMT entities that can be evaluated. I said, well, that's good because that's unambiguous. That's not like some kind of thing about star seeds and whatever, right? This is something I can latch onto. Okay. And they said they've been guided by their, they've been told by their guides and DMT to contact me and Andrew Gallimore independently of each other. And I said, hey, we know each other. So that worked out well. And now what we're working on is even before that stage is a simple proof protocol along the lines of something I've been developing. Okay. Because these two individuals feel that their entities talk to each other, each of these people. I said, okay, then let's have, if they're willing, that entity to talk to me during a DMT session and give me a code word. Oh my! God. And I've developed a little bit of a elaborate protocol for I get the code word, you get the code word. We put them in sort of an informational escrow and release them at the same time and see if the code words match. That would not to a hardcore skeptic prove the reality of DMT experiences because you could say telepathy, remote viewing, et cetera. And by the way, I'm the CFO for the Monroe Institute. So big fan of remote viewing and things like that. But it, it would demonstrate some kind of, again, meta-terrestrial knowledge base. And then it would really help us to bring in more experts. 
um, to evaluate the equations and do other things that we need to do. But this is really fascinating to me because it's a way there's some things to sink our teeth into. And just imagine, Debbie, if we could bring convincing and escalatingly strong evidence of the reality of entities that are contacted by means of DMT, what would the world be like with that? Absolutely. I've thought that so many times about plant medicines. You know, it's natural. People have been like, can you get addicted? Can you? They ask very interesting questions, but it's sure. a plant, right? It is yeah. a plant. And I always think you and I were joking before we started about intentions. I always joke about ayahuasca and intention. It's like, it's very nice that everybody's sitting around <laughs> and you have such lofty yeah. intentions, but the medicine doesn't care. Like you could say, I am mantra a million times. The medicine is going to give you exactly what you need. Yeah, and that's so, right. It gives you what you need, not what you want. hundred percent. And it can be many things. It can be a purgative and it can be, uh, you know, having to face things you haven't wanted to face. I find all of it beautiful. I really do. I'm, I'm down for all of it. And wow. So this is incredible. This gentleman finds you finds Andrew, finds out you're connected, you've come up with this code word. And I'm really curious because now this is four different individuals, but clearly there's hundreds, if not thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands around the world who have done this. Is it always the same place that you go back to and always the same beings that you interact with? And then another person has another place. How does that landscape work? It's a really good question. And there are people trying to map out the topology of the DMT verse. I would say this, um, for me, here's my DMT cat, by the way. Um, <laughs> for me, it's not always, uh, and I get the DMT stutter. It's not always the same place, but it's the same intelligence every time whether I do a small dose, a large dose, a different kind, it's not like when I may or may not have done mushrooms or acid or other things where oh, I feel connected to the tree or something. I see cool things, a vortex in the wall opening up behind my mom and I have to save her. Um, here, it's always the same intelligence. And I have, I may approach it from a different angle. I may go in deeper. It may be a more emotional catharsis. It may be more communication, but it's this, permanence of state Oof. that you just feel like it's always there and you have the privilege to either go there or as Andrew Gallimore says to have it build that world inside your brain once again for you to see it so it's not like and I call it unsobering when you come out of that because I feel it's hyper clarity it's not like feeling drugged you know you feel a lot but it doesn't feel to me high or stoned. It feels like, well, now I know the real shit that's going on. Now I see. And then when I start coming out, I feel like I am unsobering. Your most profound experience on DMT. What was the best, most profound experience you've had? <clears throat> well, that very first time asking about relation to UFOs and aliens was something. But I would say for me, <clears throat> I mentioned the song Devi Prayer. And I imagine people listening and watching, some may have heard it. It's a hauntingly beautiful song, lasts about 21 minutes. And when I play that, when I host a ceremony, and by the way, I have a whole routine with mattress pads and blankets, a little bit of honey before you do it to soothe the throat lights, <clears throat> all this. When I play that song and I do it, and you mentioned about the extended protocol that Andrew Gallimore created, I have what I call poor man's DMTX, which is a protocol. So at home, you can do an extended DMT trip as long as you want. <clears throat> and I keep refining that. But I will do 21 minutes, which is the length of Devi prayer, and I just keep going and going and going and going and going and going. I'll do maybe a dozen hits <clears throat> over that time. 
And it is so raw and so emotional. And I, I do all sorts of gestures. And my brother videotaped me last time. He says, what are you doing? Because I do all sorts of weird, complex things with my hands. I'm aware of it. I don't know why I'm doing it. And when I come out of it, I'm just, my tears are just streaming out of my eyes. Not necessarily of sadness, but of emotional cleansing and gratitude and of seeing the magnificence and just being touched by the universe reaching out to me. And it is so gut-wrenchingly emotional for me. And then I will do another session and we put on our Carlos Nakai or some other type of music. I don't move a muscle. And I'm just like, calm and just like whoa this is friggin' cool wow <clears throat> it's just but for me the most profound is that emotional journey with debbie prayer and an extended session mm, that sounds so beautiful and during your encounters how would you typify the interactions mm -hmm. that you have how would you characterize them what I'll do is I'll sort of aggregate some that I've had and experiences that I've seen with folks that I've facilitated for. I don't see entities, whether it's a jaguar head like my friend Jimmy Church or uh, insects uh, or blue ladies at a bar at a carnival or all these things. I just feel the throbbing, mostly female energy and any spectrum, male, female, good, bad just doesn't do them justice, but it's nurturing. So it feels more like a guy, a feminine entity or awareness to me. So I, I just feel like I'm just tapped into the universe. And I, sometimes I occasionally feel different entities. Um, but that's sort of what I see. I've heard so many things. Like one time I'm with um, people at contact in the desert and um, with three women, and one of them uh, at first said, okay, I'm ready for this to be over. I said, take a deep breath, and she did. She goes, oh, no, no, I love this. And she said, oh, Paul, they're here for you. And I, and I said, oh, and she's talking, and she said, they love you. Do you know them? And I, I, I don't. The other woman saw this wonderful sort of multicolored Chinese dragon, and the other woman had this big smile on her face. And her friend said, what are you seeing? And she said, the most amazing colors I've ever seen in my life. Not my color scheme, mind you, but they're incredible. <laughs> she was here designing the DMT verse. Um, and I'll, I'll mention my brother also. Um, he had done some substances. And so I facilitated DMT with him. Five minutes later, he comes out. And he said, how was it? And he says, freaking weird, man. And I said, what happened? He says, I, I think I died. And I said, oh, like in a clinical ketamine fashion? He goes, no, I freaking died, man. Like, okay, sorry. Half hour later, he's game to do it again. Okay, okay. Five minutes later, <clears throat> because it can be the businessman's high, <clears throat> he, said, he motions for me to stand up because we're sitting next to each other. I stand up and he hugs me and goes, I love you, man. Friggin' love you. And I said, what happened? He says, well, you told me to set an intention. And I said, I wanted to see the Big Bang, which is, you know, our father was an astronomer. And he said, I was taken on this tour of the birth of the cosmos, seeing galaxies being born. And the red hand of God came out and was guiding me through. And... He's later said that about that first trip where he said he died, he said, I didn't die. I just couldn't understand how fast it acted, which is one reason DMT is different. It's in our bodies. It's in it's cursing throughout the natural kingdom. And it happens so fast. Like the first time I did it, my friend said, we're, we're going to do a bong and you're going to want to try to do three hits. And after that first hit, you're going to start feeling it right away. I said, dude, I've done so many friggin' bongs. You don't feel it within seconds. I did that first hit, and you do. I'm like, oh, oh my God. And he helped me do the three hits. Um, and it's just, 
I think that it's activating what's already in you, which is why it's so fast. Because as Andrew Gallimore said, and everybody, if you do that first time, three big hits or whatever the protocol is, you do a big dose, you simply can't understand how fast your world changes. Within 10 seconds, you are experiencing things that you've never conceived of. Seven dimensional objects, entities of a superior intelligence that you cannot comprehend within seconds. And that is so overwhelming that my brother thought he had died. Others just freak out. But if you can breathe and surrender in that controlled environment with a good set and setting, you can be in for, like you have had with ayahuasca, things that have changed your trajectory three times with possibly many more to come. Mm -hmm. um, a friend of mine was doing it here and she said that she saw these little insects and she was terrified. But one of the things that I, I try to help coax into people is reinterpretation. And she did a good example of that where she was terrified of them. But then she said, oh, no, no, no. They're coming in and cleansing toxins from me. It's beautiful. So to me, two of the big lessons are this ability to see something and not right away classify it, but just to experience it perhaps without intention, just experience it. And like you said, the plant medicine gives you what you need. And the other one is surrender, not give up, but not try to direct this and trust this loving substance because it almost always will love you and give you what you, what you later or immediately realize that you really need. And it, once you do is this beautiful feeling of not trying to stage direct this incomprehensible universe with these entities that are the, the base level operating system of the universe. Yeah, so much of what you're saying, it, it's so important to not control because that's what's gonna create, I think, a difficult situation no matter what you take. And I know Bufo was like what you were describing <laughs> where I was supposed to take two puffs off of this pipe and sorry, <laughs> after the first one, poof, yeah. <clears throat> they had a pad right behind me, which was great because I was gone. I was merged with the all, you know, everyone was different. And I did one uh, synthetic and one with the toad. And then, yeah, ketamine too. I, I'll tell you, when I did ketamine, mm. I had done, I, okay, so I, I sing. I perform music and we do music for ceremonies. And so we really were there to perform for these people doing oh. mushrooms and rue. But Whoa, uh, it rue. always okay. happens, you know, I'm like, I can't, like I have to sing and I have to know what I'm singing. So I need to be sober. But then I watch everybody else and I'm like, mm. So the facilitator said, you know, do you guys want any during the break? And we both said, okay. So I uh, did the Rue and Rue is like a massive accelerator plus yep. these mushrooms. And just when everybody was coming down and they were down, they were able to eat and so forth. And I was still pretty much in it because we had started <laughs> so many hours later. <laughs> and that's when they started to do the ketamine. Oh. I'd never done it before. But um, yes, I can't remember the first way. I guess we snorted it. You know, we had a strong, yep. we snorted it. Yep. And then the, the gentleman came over and said, now you need a second bump. And what did I know? So I went ahead and, and did it in both nostrils. And again, just gone into pure hallways of sacred geometry, going through colors, things I'd never seen before. And just when I was getting to the end, a new one came. I mean, it was a pretty amazing 45 minute experience. So you're telling me that you hogged for yourself all the ketamine sacred geometry because my experience was not that, Debbie. I was at the farmer's market in Calabasas. A friend of mine introduced me to this guy. He said, oh, you should talk to Paulie. Goes around the world, speaks about interesting things. What do you talk about? Oh, uh, UFOs and DMT. He goes, DMT, 
You should come to my house tomorrow. I have some of Pablo Escobar's ketamine. Okay, so I did. So we're walking along a, a cliffside Malibu trail with this guy I hadn't ever met before except that one time and start snorting the ketamine. No sacred geometry, Miss Dashener. <laughs> I, first of all, couldn't talk. I could think. And then I could barely walk. So I'm holding his arm. Yes. And now I'm thinking, well, this was not really a great setting. I don't know the guy. I could fall off the cliff. And then some of his neighbors come by who are also, like me, teach at Pepperdine. So he says, oh, hey, Professor Paul teaches at Pepperdine. Paul, tell them what you teach. And here's what I said. Pepperdine. <laughs> and they looked at me. They were so kind. They're like, oh, yeah. And I'm thinking... I'm an idiot. And I, I could I could think clear, but I couldn't talk. I'm like, well, this is just wonderful. So they leave. And then I, I had to sit down and I'm looking at the ocean. And now the third dimension disappears. And I'm looking at a two-dimensional world. I'm thinking, yeah, this just keeps getting worse. This sucks. But luckily I'd have I have enough psychedelic scar tissue that I said, look, this will pass. Just sit here. And it did. And I remember my friend saying, yeah, I don't like DMT. And I said, yeah, I think I don't like ketamine. I think it's not my jam. Um, when I when I did Bufo, we talked about intentions. And, and my friend said, set your intention. And I'm also, I'm holding a, a world-famous crystal skull called Max from Central America. And I'm lying outside in Malibu. So you couldn't imagine. And I convened with Max for like 20 minutes before this. I'm holding Maxi Boy, as I called him by my by my side. I do the bufo. Yeah, that's nice that you have intentions. That's really, really nice. But with bufo, it, it, it doesn't really care about your intentions. It's just this rocket blast. And um, just, I, I just, you know, I had given up all drugs almost in college because I, I was like 11 years old and I put six hits of acid in a ho-ho and went and saw Jeff Rotol. Tall. So I started early. And but I I, I I sort of cycled through that and I thought I prefer clarity over distortion. But DMT is fundamentally different um, because it is clarity. It can be cleansing. It can be informative. Um, I had a friend here who um, he's, he's a well-known actor and he's been here many times. And one time he said, and he's repeated this many times. He said, that was the single best experience of my life, bar none. And the next time he said, well, this was maybe even more resonant because now I understand my relationship with my daughter. I had another somebody here who said, came out of it and said, I saw my granddaughter and I realized I've never told her I love her. And she asked me why in the DMT session. And so I saw him again later and he said, my relationship with her is so much better now. I said, I've always loved her. I didn't realize I hadn't told her that. And he says, but now our relationship is even much better. So these deeply personal cleansing or exploratory, everything is there for people who are ready for this powerful medicine and do it in a good, safe environment. I am so appalled. I'm just going to go there. I'm really appalled that that happened to you. Ketamine is what's used during anesthesia situations. Yes. It immobilizes. Yeah. Right. Immobilizes. You cannot talk. You cannot move. And the fact that somebody would, A, take you someplace public instead of someplace safe, <laughs> and B, think that you can <clears throat> walk and talk. I'm sure, you know, these poor people must have thought you well, had some it, disease. It, in, in his defense, he asked me, hey, what's your tolerance? And I'm thinking, well, ketamine, I don't know. Other things quite high. He was doing it pretty much all day. So he's used to it. And he had sort of like a, I call it a ketamine slur, where he's kind of, slow but can get it out but look i figure if you're gonna do pablo Cat pablo escobar's ketamine go for it well okay um and you know so remarkable what you're sharing it uh, 
I've never done iboga because 32 hours for, for me <laughs> to just sit there nauseous the whole time. I get it. I get that. And then like a, a week or more of really drastic reintegration. Yeah. Of no sleep, perhaps. I have a friend of mine who didn't sleep for five days after that. Oh, that's horrible. Oh, yeah. Wow. It was not pleasant at all. I mean, yeah. he, he found it valuable, but, uh, you know, DMT to me, uh, and if you do DMT, there's no throwing up. There's no, I, I cook a big dinner beforehand and have reintegration mm -hmm. treats. I baked DMT into cookies uh, that spell out DMT. And, <laughs> and there's no physical impact. And it can be five minutes. Unbelievably transformative five minutes, or it can be longer. But mm. there, and then you'll sleep like a champ that night and, and be fine. So there's so... You know, as, as you get, I mean, you know, in my younger years, yeah, let's trip all night. I don't know if I want to devote a night to any substance and feel crappy the next day anymore. But if I can do, <clears throat> I was um, at a place one time and I saw these folks, they were interested and we went and did DMT 45 minutes later. And I did an invocation and I, I, I grounded them and I, I, gave them all the information they needed as their first time to feel comfortable and the protocols and all that. 45 minutes later, we're back downstairs. They're completely reintegrated in the world. It's just, I don't know anything else like that that can take you there or build that world with so or, or no adverse impacts on your physical health or, or, or feeling and just change your world just like that. Gosh, what a good plug you make for this. I'm highly interested. <laughs> is there in DMT journeys, is there a pathway, if you know of any, that could open to awareness of secret UFO tech? Well, that's what I'm trying to do. But like like you, you've alluded to this, you don't really control these experiences. Even if you go in with an intention. So I, I'll give you an example. I had a friend here and she did multiple sessions in one night. And she did two, and she said, that's beautiful. And she's like narrating the whole time, talking. And then she did another one, and she came out and said, it was awful. I couldn't talk. I couldn't communicate. And I said, okay. And she said she wanted to do it again. I said, okay, this time, how about no intention? No talking, just experiencing. And she came out of it saying it was, it was very resonant and beautiful for her. This whole notion of intention or not, we've talked a bit about, about the plant medicine knows and loves you I, I i believe so you don't really need intention and, and now i don't so much um but i that is my purpose for starting this is to explore that potential link between this and ufos other people feel the same way to me the idea that this phenomena ufos it just feels like it could be interdimensional that explains how they find us because they're like we say, adjacent in L.A., um, why they may care, because they may be related to us in some way. Mm -hmm. We see things blink in and out, which is sort of consistent with some type of portal or traveling to another dimension. And it just feels to me like probably, I mean, my, my family friend Jacques Vallée has said, if when the dust settles on the UFO phenomena, it's only extraterrestrial, that will be deeply disappointing. There may be some extraterrestrial component, but I don't think it's all of it. I think the real riches are in interdimensional. So I really want to explore that potential link. But I've been waylaid by the beauty of that DMT world by in and of itself. Yeah, I'll bet. <clears throat> Absolutely. Yeah, if I did it, <clears throat> I think that would be something amazing to me because... I've become clear in the last couple of years that there is another force involved with my life. Uh, I don't, I don't believe it's an angelic force, although I'm sure there are angels who love me and know me, but I feel that there is um, a very benevolent, very involved in my life. Mm. I might call them my publicist who have been <laughs> opening doors. Yeah. <laughs> terrestrial publicist for real. I don't know what wow. their banner looks like, but the work they do is incredible. I mean, I've gotten invitations to things. I know how to pitch. I've never submitted myself. I've always been very happy to do what we're doing. 
and shine the light on other people. Mm. But the universe, the ETs, whatever it is, have a different plan for me. And yeah. I chose not to resist it. Uncomfortable in the beginning because I, I'm very outgoing, but I can also, you know, just not always want to be in the spotlight. And But I felt like if they're going to such efforts to open these magnificent doors and present these opportunities and ask me to step up, I'm going to be a heck yes. I'm going to say yes <laughs> and, and have a voice for this and have a voice for them, frankly. And so I would love to meet them, whatever that is. Uh, you know, I, I, they want to meet you too. I just heard them. That would be amazing. Yeah, I think... I, I think you're in a good space for that. You've had your share of experiences along this path, and this is similar to things that you've done. And I think it could give you even more depth or more focus in an area. Um, you know, n neither of us are saying, hey, go out and do DMT, right? This is a very powerful substance, right? All these sort of disclaimers. But for for those who are ready who feel the universe is calling, like I got that double tap. Hey, read this book about DMT. Hey, I help people do DMT in the same day. For people who feel ready, it's something to explore. And what people will find is if you look online, very elevated discourse about DMT. It's not a bunch of stoner bros talking about getting high. It's people just with this deep sense of reverence and appreciation and um, majesty for what they can encounter, which can be very different. It can be similar to other folks, but it, it's a wondrous substance that in the, in the right time and place can just give you kernels of insight or um, oases of meaning that you may or may not find somewhere else. I've had people say, hey, Paul, man, you don't need to do it at DMT. You can just get there at the same place doing meditation. And my thought is, well, I don't mean to discount what you experience in meditation. It could be as intense and resonant to you as my DMT. But if you haven't done DMT, you don't know what I feel. So leave me alone. This is not like, um, I think people sometimes feel it's like cheating, that I'm not doing the work of the yogi in the cave of meditating I just would be surprised, no matter how much someone does inner work and meditation, that they go to where I go, because it's not just DMT unlocking my brain. It's, I believe, DMT bringing a considerable amount to the party itself. And whether in meditation you can unlock your pineal gland and force multiply your endogenous DMT, I don't know. If you love those experiences, great but let me be. Yes, absolutely. And I think there's a really important component to riff off of what you're saying, Paul, is that people need to understand there's a relationship. Something happens. So I was also very clean, not sober. I love wine, but I was very yeah. clean. I was wild when I was younger. I did kind of lots of everything often. And then I got to a point just like it felt really good to not be that. And I made that choice for many, many decades. And then, I don't know, it changed. And my first invitation for ayahuasca was a fellow podcaster who invited a bunch of us out of country. And I was very like graceful. And I said, no, thank you so much. I'm busy. But the bubble over my head was he's crazy. That's drugs. I'm not going to go do that. And I, I was fully committed to not doing that. And three months later, grandmother ayahuasca, I say she tapped me on the shoulder, uh. but it's not what happened. I had a complete reversal. And for me, when these things, and many of them have happened, when they occur, there is zero resistance and complete knowing. And I was like, oh, okay. So I'm open to this. I'm not sure what to do. And then the universe took over. Amazing synchronicities occurred one after another. You can't write this stuff. And then I ended up at this amazing place. Uh, 
And what happens, I, I want people to understand this. It is a plant, like this is a vine and a plant mixed mm -hmm. together with water. It is cooked and it makes this psychoactive brew. But there's more that goes into it because there should be a beautiful shaman facilitating yeah. who can also put things in the brew for you, knowing they know you, right? And they know what is possible. And so once I have drunk this, it is a part of me forever. It is now I have this beautiful molecule mm. inside of me, this plant, however many times I've done it, or I believe what you're saying, the DMT, there's now a relationship that has been formed. So if people say, oh, you shouldn't, well, that's just not your path. Your path has been unfolded to you mm -hmm. and you haven't resisted it. And mm. now you have a relationship with this yeah, I just want to keep saying molecule because it's not an entity by any means, but you have a real palpable relationship. Plus, when you go over that portal after you've taken it, now there are beings there who know you and are happy to engage with you. And it's very important. And if you were meant to be meditating and receiving this, you would be meditating and receiving it. But you're not. That's beautiful. Um, yeah. Yeah. A hundred percent. Yeah. So one of my last questions with everything going on, this cuckoo caca disclosure stuff and um, UFO phenomena in the future and all of that. I feel, Paul, that we are, some of us are working toward improving our timeline for humanity and the earth. And those of us who are pretty committed to that, which I think starts with maybe things like DMT, working on yourself first, cleaning, cleaning, cleaning. So the rest out here is a better mirrored reality. I do think that benevolent beings are wanting us to be part of the galactic community and that within our lifetime or a 30 year time frame, that this is very possible. But I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Hmm. So, um, I don't give a rat's ass what the U.S. government says or does, especially less than a couple months ago. Um, there are bad faith, corrupt central actors, I've mentioned. Um, and I'll often do a role play. I've done this at MUFON Symposium and other conferences where people are diehard UFO believers, fans, whatever you want to call them. And I'll say, okay, let's pretend, let's role play that we are the top brass of the U.S. Air Force. We have all been briefed on the complete totality of what we have regarding UFOs, UAPs, alien bodies, reverse engineered propulsion systems, intact crafts, communications, whatever it is, all of us in the room know everything. And we're about to do a show of hands to vote if we're going to disclose this information. But before we do, let me tell you my feeling. <clears throat> I'll be good and goddamned if I'm going to give up this information. I will wipe my butt with your subpoena. I don't even care about the Constitution. I am here for full spectrum dominance. I'm not here for compliance. You want me on that wall. Like, you know, I am here to protect the national security of the United States of America against enemies, foreign and domestic. This technology is the most important thing in our arsenal. I am not giving it up to the Chinese and the Russians. There is no way that's ever going to happen under my watch because they will use it against us. This is the most important thing that we have. So show of hands, who wants to give it up? <laughs> and even in like at MUFON, very few hands go up because that's the mindset of the military. Don't get me started on the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, which is a completely different classification schema. So that's what we're fighting against. Now, my friends, Danny Sheehan and Richard Dolan and Steve Bassett, 
are doing amazing work to pry this out of these cold living hands. But I just don't care. I saw my father led around by the government with false intentions. I believe in if we can demonstrate the objective reality of these experiences and have a better, more fruitful conversation between experiencers of all manner of things and scientists like Seth Shostak and Neil deGrasse Tyson and Michael Shermer and others, we can really move the needle on the world status. If we get scientists and experiencers together to talk the same language, to develop proof protocols, and to convince these scientists there really is something going on here, that will propel us to a new age. And at that point, if the U.S. government wants to jump on the back of the caboose, come along for the ride, they're welcome. But they are not driving the train, in my view. I just don't I care. Absolutely agree. 100% amen and a women. Yeah, <laughs> I really concur with everything you just said. Very well said. Um, and it is, I really believe it is going to come from the people and um, these beautiful individuals whose work I also admire. And um, I also say, God bless the whistleblowers for being as brave as they yep. are. I'm um, all about it. And I think um, Nick Pope was on, it'll be a year ago, December. And uh, <clears throat> right at the end of our interview, he was saying, I truly believe you're going to see a lot more incidents I mean, he's also got knowledge that he's yep. speaking from, but a lot more incidents of whistleblowers coming down the pike. It's going to be a thing because I, I think they are feeling safer. Uh, they're seeing like the temperature that's going on out here. Uh, more and more people are waking up. And so, yeah, they're part of this movement for sure. Yeah. Nick is a friend of mine. We, we both spoke at a Pennsylvania MUFON event last month and uh, had a very nice dinner afterwards. And talk quite a lot about this. And yeah, he, he does feel there's a lot coming down the road. And my feeling is I'm just not on that road. Got it. Got it. So what are you talking about? You're presenting at February 2025 LA Conscious Life Expo. This is the 23rd annual Conscious Life Expo, February 7th through the 10th, 2025. Link in the show notes or go to debbiedashinger.com slash CLE. And are you presenting once, Paul, or are you doing a few different offerings? Don't know, and I don't know what I'm going to talk about. Ooh, um, okay. Well, if you need someone to ask you questions, I will be there. Sure. I, I think it will likely be about demonstrating objective reality, um, either that or um, the link between aliens, DMT, and Bitcoin. We've talked about each of those, but I believe they're all, all related to each other, which is a really interesting discussion as well. There's an intersection then. Yeah. Okay. I love that. So... Um, before my next question, I just want to say from my heart, thank you for this amazing interaction and conversation. Thank you for really bringing it. It's been oh, my pleasure. so good for me. And so, Paul, this is Dare to Dream. What do you okay. next dare to dream? What are your future dreams and goals? Wow. Um, well, I've mentioned some of them. You know, life extension, um, helping shine an evidentiary light in the supernatural fringes of life. Um, and I would say I, I really find meaning in helping people experience uh, plant medicine. It's been a deeply resonant thing for me. And, um, you know, I, I've shared Viktor Frankl's book, Man's Search for Meaning, with hundreds of people. Um, and I, I find in sort of my mindset of a, of a teacher and professor that I, I, I'm drifting more towards um, enabling others to experience things than my own feelings or my own experiences. Is there a place you want to send people to to connect with you or is there an offering you've got coming up, a place 
they can come see you speak. Yeah, I'm not on Twitter so much right now. I'm sort of in an information blackout and mourning after the election. Um, but people can email me. My name is paulheinig at gmail.com. That's because I, I really have a pretty anemic social media footprint. So it's, I'm kind of lurking under the under the radar. Thank you so much for spending this time with me. Thank you. What a great show. It's been a pleasure. Mm -hmm. And I end today's show with this quote from Terrence McKenna. Mm -hmm. DMT is a reliable method for crossing into a dimension that human beings have debated the existence of for 50,000 years. Is there an invisible nearby world inhabited by active intelligences with which human beings can communicate? You bet. And if you don't think so, then tell me you don't think so after you've smoked 75 milligrams of DMT. Otherwise, we just don't have anything to talk about. <laughs> Subscribe to this number one transformation conversation, Dare to Dream with Debbie Dashinger. Next week on the shows, I will be speaking with Suzanne Giesman, Teal Swan, Daryl Anka, Rebecca Dawson, Thomas Winterton, Marie Diamond, and Barbara Lamb. And remember, there truly is other worlds who are aware of you and maybe just waiting to meet you. Thanks for joining us today.